On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and I'm so honored to welcome Robert Cheek. How are you today? I'm great, Lori. How are you? Good. I will say I've been a fan for many years and I'm just tickled to be able to interview you. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate the opportunity uh, for spending time with me this afternoon and uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Awesome. So I think your story is really interesting. So could you tell us a little bit of just about your vegan journey because it started so early on a farm? Yeah, it really is an interesting journey and perhaps even more than you know, Lori, there's, there's so many layers to it. I mean, I'll start by saying uh, my father is a world-renowned animal scientist, for example. Uh, he's written about 15 textbooks teaching college students how to raise animals for food, traveled to six continents, and was giving lectures for decades. So all during my childhood, my, my dad was around the world in China and Thailand and uh, Africa, all these different places. Uh, teaching people how to uh, raise animals for food. And his specialty was rabbits. He was a rabbit specialist, even won the like Oscar award for rabbit research and all that. So he's a, he's a big time animal science wow. uh, author, uh, uh, professor emeritus at Oregon State University and met my mom at Oregon State University in the animal science department where she worked in that uh, area. And both my parents came from farming backgrounds, one in a small town in Oregon, my mom, and my dad in a small town in British Columbia, Canada. And so farming was always part of their history and therefore was part of my history. I grew up on a relatively small 20 acre farm in Western Oregon, right next to a dairy and uh, right. And then another dairy uh, about a mile and a half down the road. And, you know, just, it was just a farming community surrounded by farms in, uh, in Corvallis, the uh, home of Oregon State University. It's an agriculture town. And so I was in, I was in 4-H, uh, I raised animals for food. I, sh- I would show them at the fair and uh, take them to the auction and sell them for money because as a young uh, teenager or even younger, perhaps 10 years old, 11 years old, uh, making your own money was, was really exciting. Mm-hmm. And so, and I didn't have like, you know, I didn't know exactly, or I didn't have this like moral compass that was a dilemma in my own head and my own feelings of like, well, I've raised these, these chickens, you know, we call them fryer chickens, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure they're Cornish cross is their breed, but we you just, that's just the slang you use. Like there's like mm-hmm. beef cows, there's dairy cows, there's fryer chickens. Like this is just what we're there. We call them. Mm-hmm. So we raise chickens to be as big and heavy as possible. The, the more weight, the more you get the more money you get and sell them. I would do the same with a dairy calf and uh, for a couple of years. And uh, I grew up in that environment. And then you know, my older sister was a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a hippie type, really, in the 90s. I mean, she had this Volkswagen bus that was, she painted with the Beatles on it, and the headlights were sunflowers, and all this kind of bumper stickers and curtains inside, and she would you know, wore hemp jewelry and dresses and, you know, that were for that era, and, you know, she was really kind of alternative and she was a vegetarian from a pretty young age. She's two years older than me. And so one year we were in high school together. She was a senior, I was a sophomore. Uh, this is 1995. Uh, she organized an animal rights week at our high school. And I, I had, you know, honestly, I had little interest. I was going to fast food restaurants every day with two of my best friends who ironically, I'm still very good friends with, essentially best friends with today, 25 years later. I was. One just texted me literally 15 minutes ago. And I was, so I was going to fast food restaurants, um, the most famous one in the world, plus another sandwich shop. And I decided, you know what? Out of respect for my older sister, I'm just going to attend this Animal Rights Week just as a attendee, you know, no expectations. And I decided, okay, you know, I'll try being vegetarian for a week or vegan for a week. I didn't even know what vegan really meant. And so I did. I I attended on December 8th. Uh, That was the start date. And I listened to presenters. I watched videos of factory farming and animal testing. I read literature, mostly really uh, black and white um, print, you know, trifold brochures 
um, about about animal rights and about the animal rights um, uh, messages and the and the factory farming industry. And so and I, and I had this little camcorder I bought for like eight hundred dollars when I was fourteen because I was convinced I was going to be the next ten thousand dollar winner on America's Funniest Home Videos by falling into a swimming pool, even though I didn't have one. And so I would take this camcorder and interview people about animal rights. I had like this high pitched, you know, teenage boy voice. I still have those little tapes, uh, JVC little tapes. I haven't seen them in 25 years, but I have them in the basement here. And so I, I you know, I really got into it. I, I, I participated. I was an active participant. I, it was, and it was really the, the videos of, of, of animal testing that, that really kind of resonated with me and decided within myself that I was going to become vegan and stick with it. And so I did. And then two years later, I was organizing the, animal, organizing the Animal Rights Week for our high school as a senior before I left. And then I continued to pursue that. I, uh, I failed to mention um, this was a, a challenging time because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was the mid 90s. There was no internet. Uh, the internet came out like literally months later, but there was no internet and uh, not a lot of books, resources, role models. And I had spent my whole life wanting to be a pro wrestler, yet I barely weighed over 100 pounds. So I had this, this internal dilemma, like, like, can I actually build muscle without eating meat or drinking milk? I used to drink milk until I would get sick sometimes, like mm. almost have to vomit because I, I was so small and I was wanting to get bigger and stronger. And so, you know, my older sister tried to put me at ease and told me that, Robert, it's, it's not that we need meat, milk, and eggs. We need the nutrition that's commonly associated with those things. We need protein, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, things like that, and adequate calories, of course. And so I, I, I went with it. And uh, I, I continued, and I was a five-sport athlete in high school, so a lot of concern about that, uh, whether I could perform. Um, a lot of concern with my parents, my uh, uh, you know, animal science parents, and uh, my dad, PhD professor, and, and his knowledge of, of nutrition, animal and human nutrition, and, and uh, textbook author of many books, there was legitimate concern, as well as the fact that my sister and I, and my younger brother, who became vegetarian at age 11 at that time, because he did everything that I did, uh, we were just going a different direction. So there was wow. concern there. And so, uh, and then I have another brother who was always the farmer of the family, um, you know, cowboy, cowboy hat, cowboy boots, gun rack, pickup truck, uh, who uh, stayed true to that and is now a, a pretty big time farmer in, in Oregon with perhaps thousands of acres he manages with uh, cows and, and other, you know, uh, mostly cows, but with other crops as well. Oats, wow. Christmas trees, you know, these kind of things, hay. But that's, that's the background and it's, and it's, and it's so many more layers than that, but we don't have time for that. I mean, I mean, you can imagine though, Lori, just, just imagine, imagine what holidays are like no. in the mid nineties where you have no. animal science parents, a hippie vegan, uh, my older sister, a passion animal rights activist, myself, and now an animal rights activist athlete, my younger brother who vegetarian, who by the way is still vegetarian 25 years later, he lives an hour down the road and in, in wow. Denver area. And, uh, and then another brother who, um, you know, who was going out of his way uh, mm -hmm. to eat animals and not just, and not just eat them casually, but like essentially resented the fact, um, you know, that we were, that we were vegans and, and not eating animals and almost like made up for that, you know? Wow. So, so the dynamic there um, and nothing says it better than the vehicles parked outside our house. <laughs> and I'll finish with that. My, my sister in her hippie bus with a bumper sticker, if you love animals called pets, why do you eat animals called dinner? And my brother with this big pickup truck and a gun rack, enjoy a juicy steak tonight. That was the juxtaposition that I grew up with. Um, so that's just a little insight uh, before all this bodybuilding, before being a writer, before all this stuff, that's the environment that I came from that shaped my worldview oh. and my animal rights perspective that I still carry today. Oh my goodness. So uh, there's so many elements here that we could talk about. So I am curious, uh, your, your parents are, are they still not understanding what you're doing 25 years later or are they a little so more supportive? They are, they're understanding um, and, and supportive uh, now these days. It, maybe it was only a handful of years. They weren't supportive, mostly in the nineties. By the time 
2000s came around, I had, you know, I had moved, I had moved out. I was 19, 20, 21 years old. I was working on cruise ships, traveling around the world. I was doing my own thing. I'd started a vegan bodybuilding brand in 2002 that I've, you know, running now for 18 years. I was competing in bodybuilding by the next year. I was winning in bodybuilding competitions two years later. You know, I, I was filming documentary, writing books, like working for Forks Over Knives, you know, on down the list. They, the way I word it, um, the way I, I told Dr. T. Colin Campbell recently, who, you know, he's, he signed books for my, my father and, um, and they know of each other and each other's work and all that. And I, the way I described it to Dr. Campbell is that my, my dad is intellectually on board. Like, like absolutely, he, he, he knows, you know, he's, he's a smart guy, right? He's a scientist and author of 15, you know, technical textbooks, like he, smart guy. Uh, he's intellectually on board with a plant-based diet from a, a health perspective, a resource perspective, and even, even, an, uh, even an animal rights perspective. In fact, his quotes were some of the first ever circulating decades, I mean, decades ago, even when I was brand new to being vegan, uh, my, my dad's quotes and some of his, his books were challenging the, the ethical standpoint of uh, producing animals for food in his own textbooks. Hmm. So he had something like, uh, I can't remember the name, along the lines of like ethics and animal agriculture, um, that wasn't exactly the book title, but it had that theme. And so my dad's quotes were in those those old school uh, vegan outreach booklets uh, back when they were still black and white 20 years ago or 25 years ago, and then in color, and they're still being printed today, you know, quarter century later, and, and millions have been published. He, he challenged, I used to have them memorized. In fact, I even used my dad's quote in my first book. <laughs> um, but but it ba basically, it, one of his quotes goes along the lines of, I'm trying to remember it here, you know, do we, have, do we as humans, with all our cumulative accumulated knowledge over the years have the right to take the life of other sentient beings in essence should we know better that's essentially it i almost memorized it exactly so but and he had other quotes like that too you know along those lines of if slaughterhouses had glass walls we would all be vegetarian which who's i don't remember even remember who said that um huh. maybe peter singer or somebody else but my, my dad had a bunch of those quotes too ba wow. back when peter singer was doing this and and others and so that's the, that's this that's this interesting thing. He's intellectually on board, but not in practice, and that's mostly because he's in his seventies and he's been living a, a specific lifestyle for a long time and and resist change. Now I know countless people who have changed in their seventies, in their eighties. I even met someone on the vegan cruise who this is so, this is actually really cute. She was like ninety one, and she be, she became vegan like at age eighty nine or something because Dr. Esselstyn was her hero. Um, after watching Forks Over Knives and she came on the cruise to meet him. And here's this woman in her 90s and I had a conversation with her on the cruise one year. So I know people can change, but for whatever reason, uh, my parents have not, um, oh. have not a, a, a adopted a plant-based diet. They have at times, uh, both of them, um, at times have gone plant-based for periods of time, but you know, nothing more than a month maybe. Um, yeah. But they are supportive of what I do and uh, understanding of, Obviously, holidays have changed, and uh, now that we're all adults, um, over the last fifteen to twenty years, and and uh, everyone, when we do get together for holidays, which is most years, uh, you know, prepares vegan food, and and that's and that's all well and good. So mm -hmm. um, there, there's just and that's and that's it's worth talking about because there's a lot of people. I'm sure you see this in your work. A lot of people who are intellectually on board with the impacts on the environment, the impacts animals go through, the impacts on human health but they're resistant to making their own changes. And that's what I see within my own family. And ultimately I decided that, you know, the best thing I can do is lead by my own example. And you, and there's something I learned. Um, it took me a long time to learn this. I think 24 years. I only learned it last year <laughs> is that you can't, you can't make other people change. Um, you can't, you just can't change someone. Um, mm -hmm. You can change yourself and you can change how you react and respond to different people and their decisions but you can't force someone into making a change. You can lead by example, you can inspire, you can be a cheerleader, you can be their biggest fan, you can do whatever you can, you can introduce them to documentaries and, and films and books and, and go listen to speakers and attend conferences and, and give gifts of health and wellness and, and do everything that you can, but you can't force someone to change. And as soon as I, I accepted that uh, within my own family, because that's, that's like it's, you know, you feel, 
lost at times or that you failed or, or heartbroken or whatever, but I realized I've been able to impact, you know, a lot of other people through my books, through my film, through my website for 20 years, through my speaking on four or five continents. Like I realized there's, there's still effectiveness and viability in what I do, even if I don't have that direct impact on my brother, my sister-in-law, my mom, my dad, uh, relatives who came mm -hmm. from farming backgrounds and who live in the farming community. Right, absolutely. And you're exactly right. We can't, people only do what they want to do, right? So what I found that's kind of helpful with that, because I, we, we just launched in March the first plant-based telehealth lifestyle medicine practice and we're in 47 states and uh, Dr. Clapper is on board with us and we're adding more doctors. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but what I found over the years is, is that honestly, if I see there's a goal or objective, I find a way to get plant-based diet somehow to help them move it faster. <laughs> so I was like, you know, you can move and then you got velocity that moves you a little faster in the direction you want to go. I, I try to, you know, see what I can do to help someone understand and open their eyes to that a plant-based diet could actually maybe help you do whatever that may be. So um, there's ways of, of delivering the message, I guess. I consider us like, you know, it's almost like a salesperson trying to do this sometimes. <laughs> so um, I just try to be a better sales marketer than uh, someone else down the street. So that that really is key though. But it's true, you, you can't, people aren't gonna do what they don't wanna do. So it's very, very true. And that's actually why I started this podcast for years ago. I was like, why were you able to do something? Why can't I get someone else to do something? You know, the same thing, but you can and they can't. And it's, it's just, just really interesting, fascinating, cool. Well, you said December 8th. So what does that mean 25 years later? So, um, well, obviously I've got a, a vegan anniversary coming up. It's a big one. I, like a lot of people, I think maybe, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm the minority here. Or it's a little bit um, out of left field or too cheesy, but I, you know, I, I, I celebrate my vegan anniversary as much as my birthday, you know, like that kind of level of importance, because it's, it's something I decided I had control over and it, and it's something that's meaningful to me. It's a, it's a powerful decision that I made and committed my, my life to, uh, whereas, you know, I had nothing to do with being born. So it's not as quite as important. Um, so, <laughs> I, but I also feel like celebrating is the wrong word. Um, I don't want to celebrate myself. Like I don't, I don't throw a party for myself because I'm vegan for X number of years, whether it's three years or 10 years or 15 or now 25. It's not, it's not to celebrate me, but it's to celebrate the vegan lifestyle. And so mm -hmm. I'm not going to go out and buy a bunch of vegan cakes and all of that. I mean, of course it's one way to support vegan industry, but like there's just different ways that I, that I view that. Uh, so it is important. It is meaningful last year at the start of my 25th year, so on my 24th vegan anniversary, um, kind of cliche, but I, but I went to an animal sanctuary and donated time and, and, and worked on a farm in Arizona, uh, Amy's Farm Sanctuary, and hung out with a bunch of animals. And it was a you know, winter, so even in Arizona, it was a, like a wet and cold and muddy day, but, but it was great. Like that, that felt meaningful to me. And now in the age of COVID, um, I don't know, honestly, I, I've only looked into it very briefly. Because I don't know exactly what this next week is going to bring, but you know, I might be interested in doing the same kind of thing. I know there's some farm animal sanctuaries around here in northern Colorado, including here in Fort Collins and Boulder area, and throughout the uh, the state. If they're accepting visitors, it's just like a, a way for me to to kind of get grounded and and uh, you know, like not that I have to remind myself why I'm doing it, but it's a, just a rewarding reminder. You know, it's not like I need the reminder, but it's something I I, I find. Um, I, I found joy, I find joy in. So I might do something like that. Um, you know, I may uh, try to, again, it's kind of cliche too. you know, create some sort of uh, fundraiser event or, or, or something like, you know, I, I try not to uh, go too overboard and make it too much about me, but I do like to at least acknowledge the day that like mm -hmm. when that day comes around, um, December 8th every year, it is a meaningful day for me. So at this point, don't know exactly what I'm doing. I'm in the middle of finishing book revisions. Uh, for a new book. I'm working on some major stuff with Vegan Strong, nonprofit I work with. I've got deadlines um, that are work-related. Uh, may just have a low-key day with my wife and our dogs and just, uh, you know, just be grateful for the, uh, the opportunity to be in this movement and be part of it, uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, especially for so long. Yeah, absolutely. And when you, you know, we kind of bounced around it, but can you describe 
what you mean by a vegan lifestyle. So, cause I think, you know, I get this question a lot. It's like, what's a vegan, vegetarian, what is plant-based, but can you describe what is the true underpinnings of living a vegan lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, I, I there's obviously a, a, a definition, you know, coined by Donald Watson back in 1944, I think it's in one of my books as well. Um, but, you know, there's also lots of different interpretations of veganism. And I don't, I don't really, I used to be a big fan of really stringent, strict rules and definitions and all of that, but I've grown to um, just be more open to people's different interpretations and and their positive work that they do and however that resonates with them. But essentially, to me, uh, veganism is not um, exploiting animals in any way. So, I mean, that means not just not eating them or wearing them, but not keeping them captive, not testing uh, products on them by, you know, tying down their arms and legs and putting things in their eyes, um, not exploiting them for some sort of uh, personal benefit, um, whether that's putting in a, in a cage or a, a zoo and charging money for, you know, to view them while they stay captive or, or, or hunting them, you know, as far as, you, you, you know, someone's interpretation of spending quality time together with their kids out in the, out in, in the backwoods of Colorado or Wyoming or Montana. Um, obviously not that. And, and also um, just not using wearing byproducts in, in cosmetics and, uh, in food products, beverages, clothing, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of materials and just living basically a compassionate life. And that's kind of a mouthful. And so I'll stick with what I first said, which was just not exploiting animals in any way and doing that to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely see that. And it's interesting because depending on where you enter into eating plants, I'll just start there. Many people enter into a plant-based living lifestyle, but then they so much is revealed in that process that you find yourself moving towards the vegan component as well. So um, it's really fascinating to see that kind of um, progression. Like my husband, before we went plant-based in 2011 or 12, um, used to fly fish, like catch and release. And, but over the years, he's like, I don't want to do that anymore. And so it's, it was really interesting to see that kind of, um, progression into uh, more of the vegan component. And our mutual friend, JP, John Pierre, he, he talks about a planet uh, living, you know, as far as like the looking at the environment and all that too, is yeah. another really important component, which veganism embraces, which I really appreciate. So it's, it's a really cool place to be right now in the middle of all that, for sure. Yeah. And just to add to that, a few public references, I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying this, but you, as you know, there's a lot of people who enter into this lifestyle from a plant-based diet, from a nutrition or health perspective. And this is still going back decades. So this is not nobody new. But for example, two uh, good friends of mine, um, I'm sure uh, friends or colleagues of yours in, in some regard, uh, Brennan Brazier and, and Rip Esselstyn, uh, both came to a plant-based diet. Early on, they're absolutely pioneers. They came to a plant-based diet for health and performance benefits. Uh, for Brennan Brazier, he was in the, in the 90s early 90s, he was trying to be a, a great uh, professional triathlete and realized that if everyone trains the same, like all the same workouts and they have similar genetics, because he's talking like being one of the best in the entire country. So if everyone's at the top of their game, mm. uh, what could separate one person from another? And he thought that could be diet. And so he experimented on what if, what if I increased, you know, high energy foods and reduced it, you know, foods that cause inflammation and foods increase intake of foods that aid in recovery process, and, and help build muscle and repair muscle tissue and, and provide tons of energy and carbohydrate fuel, but without you know, tough digestion on heavy animal protein, um, what could that do? And so he came to this lifestyle from a health perspective only, but over the years, he became more and more and more compassionate uh, toward animals or sympathetic to vegan concerns and vegan ethics. And you, you know, within a, a relatively short amount of time was identifying, you know, to some degree as a vegan and, and all of that back in the early days when I met him uh, 15 years ago, 2005. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, he, he came through that path and now is considered one of the greatest vegan athletes and ambassadors around. And Brendan Bray, I mean, uh, and Rip Esselstyn, same thing, you know, his father was doing research at the Cleveland Clinic in the early 80s around 1984 or so. And, and Rip was busy being an elite swimmer at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, 
his dad had this great research, Dr. Carl Esselstyn, this great research that a plant-based diet can prevent and maybe even reverse heart disease. And so their whole family started eating that way. Rip would go home for the you know, during the summers from college and eat a plant-based diet and then went on to fuel his uh, professional triathlete career as one of the best triathletes on the planet um, and the best swimmer in that category of professional triathletes on a plant-based diet and has now been doing it for something like 30 whatever the math is, uh, you know, 30, what's that? 36 years, a long Something time, like long time. But, but, but he also is now, you know, sympathetic and empathetic to vegan concerns and, and doesn't do the leather shoes and the belt and all that stuff. And these are prominent people who came from a health perspective, who widened their mm. circle of compassion as, uh, as some people say, I forget who, whether it's Colin Patrick Goudreau or someone else, uh, but widen your circle of compassion. Um, they're just too, men who have done that because you don't see a lot of, you just don't see that as much as like men, of course you get me and JP, but not as many who embrace the ethics of, of mm -hmm. veganism, like the way that women do. Perhaps women are a whole lot smarter than men. And I'm convinced that's probably the case. Um, you're uh, going to let, you're going to be married a long time just because you said that. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I think, I think, well, I think it's true. I think there's other reasons why men, uh, uh cling to this um, meat eating masculinity as well. And it's another, another conversation, another topic, but, um, but I'm, just, I'm just proud of people like Brendan and Rip and Rich Roll and John Pierre and, and so many, Tori Washington, so many others mm. who have chosen compassion in this masculine world of being, of being athletes. You know, these are all athletes and trainers and coaches and world-class athletes I'm talking about who have right. not succumbed to the pressure of from their peers to consume animal protein, but said, no, there's a, not only a healthier way, but a more compassionate way. I'm gonna show you, and I'm gonna take it all the way to elite status, maybe even some of the best in the world at doing right. this, like Scott Jurek has. So, um, another, so another Coloradoan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, I think that's amazing. You're, you're exactly right. And the beautiful thing is those inspire the everyday person to, you know, up their game and maybe, you know, reach, you know, goals athletically or whatever that they would have never dreamed of either. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm turning 50 this year and I'm training for my first ultra. Um, so I'm super excited, but I don't feel like I'm 50, but I feel like I'm in my twenties. So I'm like, why not? <laughs> so awesome. you know, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a lot of fun to be able to move a body that's a half a century old and go, this is going against the grain of everything in America that, you know, we hear and see, right. You should be, you know, you know, taking those medications and seeing your doctor and you know, putzing around, but no, no, we're out doing stuff and, and new adventures. So I think it's, it's a phenomenal point. Um, and we spoke a little bit, but I really don't want to just kind of gloss over the fact, you know, with the, your company and the vegan bodybuilding that you've been doing for so long, how did you decide to go into the, the bodybuilding aspect of it? Cause I think that's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I, it's almost silly now um, to talk about it or think about, but you know, we, we were all kids, right? We were all kids once. And I, I mean, I was obsessed with pro wrestling. I wanted to be a pro wrestler, like the WWF, the Hulk Hogan, you know, yes. Andre, like, Yes. I, I grew up watching that on television. Didn't have cable at home on the farm, but on Saturdays they had the, the wrestling on Saturdays I could watch. And so I really wanted to be a pro wrestler. And so I figured, well, I've got to get bigger and stronger. I was a five sport athlete in high school, as I mentioned. And mostly I was an endurance runner. I don't think I really mentioned that. I, was a, mm -hmm. I even ran in college for one year. I was, a, I was yeah. a decent endurance runner, small and fast. And so it worked, lightweight, worked for me. <laughs> So in order to become a pro wrestler, I had to get bigger and stronger. So I started lifting weights and I knew nothing. I knew nothing about the sport of bodybuilding. I was actually turned off by it. I would go to the, I remember the Safeway store in the, in the town I grew up in. And I couldn't even look at the magazines that had all the veins on, on the, the muscle magazines, with the veins all over. I couldn't look at it. But as I started lifting weights and got bigger and stronger myself, my childhood friend who I used to go and eat, you know, uh, fast food with, who just texted me half an hour ago. Uh, he, he showed me some bodybuilding magazines and told me about these professional bodybuilders who would compete in this Olympia, which is like the Super Bowl of bodybuilding. Knew nothing about it, didn't know a single one of their names. And this actually has a, a funny a twist to the story, which I'm glad you actually brought it up. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, so I, 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 I just really fell into it. And I was a huge fan. You want to know how big of a fan I was? I, I paid um, from this friend who just texted me. Uh, 
uh, to fly us both out to Ohio, and, and this is way back 2001, and pay $360 each for VIP tickets on top of the flights and the hotel and all this to uh, meet Arnold Schwarzenegger and get a photo with, with Arnold. And so I have a photo, which I often throw up on for Throwback Thursday for fun of me as a, as a 21-year-old kid. And it was on my birthday because Arnold's event every year is in March, around March 2nd. So it was on my birthday and, and my friend Jordan and I got our photo, photos taken with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I still have those as Polaroid photo. You weren't supposed to say anything to him, but of course I did. I talked <laughs> in his voice to him, you know, from his movies. Um, and he got him to laugh. And so he has a nice laugh in the photo. Uh, and so I got into bodybuilding that way. And I had posters all over my wall of these bodybuilders that I'll just go to the punchline that now, I mean, literally now, 20 years later, they come by my, my booth, my Vegan Strong booth at the biggest uh, fitness expos in the world. And I signed books for them, people that I idolized oh, on my wow. wall, you know, Chris Cormier, Quincy Taylor, all kinds of people. I've been friends with Jay Cutler, arguably the second greatest bodybuilder in history for 20 years now. And, and, and you know, I, these are people that now are colleagues or people I'm signing books for that I, I just looked up to and idolized. And so with my, my back injuries, I mentioned off camera, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I never like to make excuses, but they've been there ever since I injured myself as a 16 year old in, in sports in high school and had mm -hmm. to do physical therapy and take six months or more off from exercise and Jeez. deal with, um, uh, some disc issues, in my spine and nerve damage and all that that's impacted me my whole life. And so I never, I never felt comfortable going into the pro wrestling, although I was looking into the pro wrestling schools and I was going to go do that. <laughs> And again, ironically, now I'm friends with famous pro wrestlers who have been champions like in WWE and been wrestled at WrestleMania. I've been to their houses. I'm friends with them. And it's just really like my younger kid, my younger self would faint. I would just completely faint if you said that I'm like now signing books for these pro wrestlers that, you know, I, I the industry I grew up watching on TV and um, and same with these bodybuilders that people I I. I idolized and traveled around the country to watch them compete in California, Ohio, Nevada. Like I would pay as a fan. Um, huh. Now I know them and sign books for them. It's just. It's I interviewed crazy. Diamond Dallas Page. Yeah, yeah. I, he's actually put me in the diamond cutter before. Oh, you're I have kidding a photo. Me. No I, way. I, I, I knew, not, I'm not saying friends with or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I knew, I knew Carl Malone. Okay, I, okay. I was living in Salt Lake City. Carl Malone was, it was still at the height of his career. He was, they had just been eliminated from the playoffs um, in the late nineties by the Portland trailblazers, my, my, <laughs> home, my home state. Yeah. And we were, we were in the gym together and I was wearing a Portland trailblazers shirt while there were clips on TV of, of, of him being eliminated. And oh, he was wow. back in the gym the next day. And Amazing. somehow, you know, just striking a conversation, he invited me to a party he was hosting. And that was during the time towards the end of his basketball career, he was getting into WWE making appearances and he was partnered with Diamond Dallas Page oh. so he invited me to a party out in like <laughs> Park City Utah and I have a photo with Diamond Dallas Page putting me in the diamond oh cutter which is his God. signature move and that... like my childhood <laughs> friends it would used to lose their mind when they would see that and I met many many other pro wrestlers along the way and and yeah. I know all the bodybuilders and now to this day I'm I was in touch with a pro wrestler yesterday who has a million and a half followers on Instagram and I sent wow. him one of our vegan strong boxes and signed books for him that he held up in photos and and, That's awesome. and, he's, and he's vegan now and he's a giant giant guy he's like a 300 pound guy with muscle everywhere and wow. but that's the really uh long and kind of fun interesting story of wow. how I got into bodybuilding was to be a wrestler which that's my awesome. back couldn't handle um right for whatever whatever reasons my, my spine injuries I just didn't want to risk it so yeah. I got into bodybuilding instead and eventually found mediocre success, nothing like me, my Delgado of today and Tori Washington of today, but I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was one of the only people doing it at the time, a yeah. decade and a half ago. And so my mediocre success gave me some sort of platform that enabled me to write books about the topic and, and perhaps open doors for some other people who have uh, uh, succeeded far beyond anything I ever did. I, I, a quick example is Corinne Sutton, one of my great friends. Yes, Corinne, I've interviewed him last uh, week, actually. Yeah, so I'm a two-time natural bodybuilding champion. Corinne is a 20-time <laughs> bodybuilding champion as a vegan. I mean, yeah. I get to be on podcasts and interviews and documentaries because I was a two-time bodybuilding champion. Corinne has won 10 times more than I have and with much stiffer competition and in a different era. Like, 
I honestly, Lori, I got, I got lucky in the sense that I was early to this whole thing. I was, I was a vegan athlete when hardly anybody in, in the world was, and it gave me an opportunity to be in magazines, newspapers, like New York times and, and all that stuff because there weren't a lot of people to choose from. And so that's the only reason I'm doing what I'm doing now uh, and able to write books and, and get this, this recent book deal, which is very, very exciting uh, because of that history, not what I'm doing necessarily today, um, but what I did way back then. But it speaks volumes of you as a visionary, right? And following your path and in, in, in leading the way. So I think that's phenomenal. Just like if there wasn't a Campbell or an Esselstyn or Ornish, you know, all these amazing docs, I wouldn't have been able to tread the way I had because it was Dr. Campbell's book that convinced me nine years ago after a patient and accidentally <laughs> went to a plant-based diet. It was interesting in Western Colorado and Rifle by where I was practicing. I was like, where was this all my life? This is amazing. And yeah, it's so those you blaze the trails, just like I was telling Sarai. So Sarai had MS. I said, you had to get MS to be the person you are now to share this message. So I think it's, there's reason. I think it's amazing. So yes, absolutely. So tell us about the vegan strong box. You mentioned this. Um, what is that and how can we get involved? Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's kind of the thing I do 24 seven these days when I'm not <laughs> reviewing my book. So, um, you know, I've been touring, traveling, doing my thing. I've been speaking for 15 years and mostly like a lot of people, a lot of the vegan circuit, you know, veg mm -hmm. fest, vegan conferences, festivals, that kind of thing from Australia to California, you know, all over the place. And it was always a goal of mine to have a booth at these at these big expos that I would attend as a fan where I've met Arnold Schwarzenegger and where I've met all the bodybuilders and celebrities and pro wrestlers. There's even NBA stars. I met Mike Tyson, signed a book for him. Oh, wow. um, I you know, met all these. And actually that was through John Pierre, by the way, I got to give John Pierre credit. Oh. He's the one that gave my book to Mike Tyson, who then came out and talked to me about it. I got to work out with Emily Deschanel when she was in Boulder. I got to work out with her book. Wow. Because of JP and interview her. So now I'm like, all right. <laughs> JP is a connector. I got Emily to write an endorsement for my book, Shred It. And awesome. um, JP also, like, I know we're on a tangent here, but I've like, I've actually been on the Def Leppard tour bus. And that was because JP told me <laughs> who Phil Collin was. I didn't know who Phil Collin was. As it turns out, he's one of the greatest guitarists in the world. And I've got his, you know, number my cell phone now. But all those years ago, I didn't know who he was. Right. I never listened to Def Leppard, but now I, I you know, my wife and I go backstage at the shows and I've awesome. worked it out with Phil, like while his music is playing, you know, pour some sugar on me, like while we're working out, it's, he's, he's, he's been at our vegan strong booth, taking photos there and, and all that. So love it. Then that's, that's JP. You know, that's all JP. Yes, that is JP. JP's and, you know, great. He, he's the one that made those connections. So always, always credit to JP. Okay. And so Back to the story, though, like I wanted to have a booth there. I, I thought that veganism could have a presence at these big fitness expos, which some get a quarter million people attending, wow. 80,000, 50,000, 20,000. Amazing. And so um, I worked hard to make that happen. I had that, that vision probably 15 years ago, talking to Brendan Brazier about it. Finally was able to uh, get a budget to do it, uh, put a team together, and had a vegan bodybuilding tour uh, for a year at these fitness expos all over the country. And then I got this opportunity to work with this vegan strong um, car, race car at NASCAR events like Daytona and Talladega and all that. And so I, that was with Leilani Munter. She had a vegan strong race car. I said vegan strong on it. And so I connected with that organization that was putting, making that car on the track um, that Corinne worked with as well. And he, you know, he and I traveled around to these NASCAR events promoting veganism at this booth, this tent at, at the events. And then Vegan Strong kind of absorbed my vegan bodybuilding tour and became a Vegan Strong tour, which we've now been doing for two or three years until COVID hit. And so basically what we would do is have a big 20 foot, 20 by 10 booth uh, at these mainstream, I'm talking like super mainstream fitness events. You know, like one wow. time at the Olympia, the Super Bowl of bodybuilding, there were literally 500 booths and only three of them were vegan brands. Like us wow. and like a protein bar and a protein powder or something. Like there's like nothing at some of these. Other ones like LA Fit Expo, there might be 20 vegan booths there, which is really cool, but out of hundreds, you know? Yeah. So, and they attract tens of thousands of people. So we wanted to have that presence. Yeah. And so we did. So we put a team together, about six of us of champion vegan athletes, mostly bodybuilders, men and women who would work the booth. And we would have, we created our own booklet, this 36 page full color vegan strong booklet, which has 
uh, lists of, of protein content of plant-based foods. It has recipes, it has photos of food and of champion vegan athletes. It has, you know, the benefits of a plant-based diet. It has muscle building uh, meal plans, fat burning meal plans, uh, workout photos with all these buff men and women flexing and training. And uh, we passed those out by the tens of thousands and, and we got uh, uh, company sponsors. I have a big poster here on my wall with looking at them, Beyond Meat and 22 Days Nutrition and PV2 and Plant Fusion and Vega, Unisoy Vegan Jerky, No Meat Athlete, Plant Fusion, you know, Not A Moo, Green Regiment, all these, all these brands yeah. that would give us products that we could pass out on, on tour and coupons and literature. And we would give presentations on stage about the benefits of plant-based diet. So that was great. We met all kinds of celebrities, you know, everyone from Billy Blanks to, from, from Tybo. Um, no who, way. Tybo, I love those tapes. I still, oh, those VH are the best. I had my third kid. Billy Blanks was my ticket to getting in shape. Yeah, yeah. He's, yes. we, we had a bunch of photos with him. Awesome. Um, and Eric, the trainer, and, uh, you know, a bunch of people we met along with. Oh, wow. So, so that's how it started. We had this Vegan Strong tour we sold. Mostly, we mostly gave away information. We mostly just gave away stuff, products and coupons. And eventually we decided, well, we can sell some stuff and make a little bit of money, you know, to cover our costs. And so we started sure. printing t-shirts and we, sure enough, we sell, sold over a thousand of those, maybe 2,000 Vegan Strong t-shirts. And vegans started to show up at these events in addition to the non-vegan crowd. So, of course, we're, we're there to reach the non-vegan crowd, which we do. 95% of people who, who come by our booth are non-vegan. But we also get, we get the, like, the vegan enthusiasts from San Diego or Anaheim or San Jose or Columbus or Orlando or mm. Houston, Dallas, wherever we would go on tour, Vegas, Phoenix, they would come out. And so we'd sell some apparel. And then um, when this whole coronavirus hit, um, I was just getting off the vegan cruise. We'd heard about the virus while we were on the cruise. Our cruise ended February 27th or February 28th. And I got home and literally days later, you know, my birthday, my 40th birthday, everything shut down and no Expo West, no tours, no expos, everything shut down. And so we thought for one, we had 10,000 products left over <laughs> that were donated from these different brands wow. that we could pay hundreds of dollars, if not thousands to like ship them back. Cause we already, we already shipped them to events that got canceled. And we decided we would box these up and start recruiting more brands, more, um, more plant-based companies that we can spread the word about and create these nice little boxes that have like $150 value that we would sell for $49.99 as a fundraiser for Vegan Strong. Since we can't tour, we can't do the things that we used to do to have an impact on people. And then we eventually, in the last year of our tour, we would sell hundreds of items per event, which help pay for our costs and bring in some revenue, cover operating costs. And the rest, we just get funding um, donation dollars. Yeah. And so uh, that's how it started. We just had a lot of leftover products and still a desire. And we had a newsletter list, Vegan Strong, of thousands of people that were 95% non-vegan because that's how we would get them. We would, you'd have to sign up at our booth for a newsletter, you get a free free product or multiple uh, products free. Gotcha. So we passed out plant-based, you know, Vega samples when you sign up. And these are like $3 bars, you know, or $3 packets of protein. This is like we'd send it, you know, hand a couple of them to each mm. person. So you get like six or ten dollars worth of stuff for signing up. So we had thousands of people on our newsletter list and figured this was still a way to reach the non-vegan audience by bundling all these products that we are that they already know and love, you know, um, protein powders, but they're just used to consuming whey and casein and 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 you know, beef jerky and, and um, egg-based products. And so what we found was that we would do plant-based proteins and plant-based jerky and, and plant-based electrolytes and plant-based pre-workout and plant-based all this other stuff and bring in some snacks to the mix and get Beyond Meat and other big brands on board who will give like free product coupons to our audience. And so we made these boxes and I made them available on veganstrong.com and all the proceeds, every single bit goes back into our organization, which at the, at the moment is mostly like paying for the cost of the boxes and the shipping because we ship them for free and for the, the printing and for the supplies and for the tape and the labels and the printer and all this stuff. Um, and, and, but they've been an absolute hit. Uh, we've been doing it for a few months now, hundreds of customers. Um, many have said it's the best monthly vegan box they've ever seen. And partly it's because we, because we work with so many companies, we're able mm. to provide that value, $150 value for only $50. So it's like me, wow. uh, it's like you giving me a $50 bill and me turning around and giving you three of them uh, <laughs> because we get really, really good value, like high quality stuff, like, like straight up just free product coupons from like Beyond Meat or Not A Moo or Follow Your Heart or Daya, like no nice. cost involved, just go get a free $10 item off the shelf. Plus physical items from like 25 companies 
um, bags of jerky, full size products too, full size ten dollar bags of hemp seeds, and education too. We had a book in our first box, a copy of Veg News magazine. We had fitness equipment in our second box. Our third box, which comes out next week in December, has a mystery item in there, vegan strong branded item we just produced. Uh, loads of products, and so. Uh, that's what we're doing now as a means to keep our, our vegan strong nonprofit organization going. Well, we can't do the things it was founded to do, which was go mm. speak in person, educate the non vegan audience about the benefits of a plant based diet. Uh, we used to sell books and give lectures. We did cooking demos on stage, like the, the full thing with like the pans and the burners and making food and, and, and sharing it with people wow. at, at these fitness expos. And we did a great job. Like we inspired so many people, including Champion non-vegan bodybuilders, um, you know, omnivores uh, of all types to adopt a plant-based diet and have the confidence because I used to joke, even at 210 pounds and, you know, pretty good size uh, guy, I'm, I'm like the smallest guy at the booth. Like we have these really big men and women who have built their bodies with plants and it's, and it convinces a lot of people. We brought power lifters and bodybuilders. Like, you know what Corinne Sutton looks like? I mean, unbelievable. Yes. yes. Uh, and Nimai has been at our booth and Tori Washington oh my goodness. and uh, Natalie Matthews who's one of the best bikini competitors on the planet. And Vanessa Espinoza, also from Colorado, mm. um, who is a you know, all American basketball player, three time golden gloves, boxing champion, powerlifting champion, almost set a world record in her first event. She is stronger than, you know, me and five other people combined. Like, like we had this great team. And, and we really made a difference. And so we can't do that now. And so we thought we'll bring the education together, put it in a box, you know, this whole like monthly subscription box model, but we don't even do a subscription. It's just one box at a time, no commitment, you know, hopefully you'll yeah. love it buy the next box, but if not, fair enough. Or you can buy three or four boxes. We had one woman buy nine boxes um, to give as gifts um, to, to her non-vegan friends all throughout the South, you know, throughout Alabama and Louisiana and Texas and Arkansas. And it's been it's been really cool. So, and, and, and we're up to at the time of our conversation, Lori, early December, uh, 101 brand partners now, and I've recruited every single wow. one. Uh, wow. We have a great team who do other things, who do the shipping, who do the assembling, who do the website. I'm the product guy. So I've got 101 brands on board and they're absolutely incredible. And, and those are, again, are on veganstrong.com. They're right on the front of the website. It's, it's the best value that I know of in our entire industry, as far as physical products, like physical foods, beverages, sports, nutrition, snacks, specialty items, and goods, along mm -hmm. with coupons. It's the best value that I know of. That is phenomenal. Maybe there's something we can do too. I, we have a few things that maybe we can talk about afterwards. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah we do all kinds of inserts, yeah. and coupons, and flyers, yeah. and stuff in the boxes. Uh, awesome. Cool. Um, so that's at veganstrong.com. Yeah, veganstrong.com. Got it. Okay. Excellent. We'll definitely put the link there, guys. And then you have a new book coming out Absolutely. next year. Tell us about that. Cause I, <laughs> I, yeah, I have, when I was in medical school, I had three little kids. So when I started medical school. My kids were five, three and 10 months. And just a quick, in my, my brief life with book publishing, um, I started drawing cartoons to memorize things because I, I saw that I read about that <laughs> visual mnemonics. And I published seven books in medical school and it was a really intense process. And mine was very minor. It wasn't like writing, like it was like cartoons and facts and stuff, but, um, it is a process for sure. The editing and talking and other people are giving their opinion. You have to listen, <laughs> but tell us about that process. That is fascinating. It's, it's like another episode. It's a, we can do an hour on that because I've, I've done, I've been, I've self-published um, and I even had a self-published bestseller, which is almost unheard of, um, enabled me to buy a house and do all these things because I owned a hundred percent of it. Um, and it was meant to be an ebook in the first place and turned out to be like this 400 page. Was it Shred It? Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. a good book. It's a it very was, good book. And endorsed by all kinds of celebrities and everything, but I did all that myself and it was supposed to be actually true story behind it was a, like a 60 page ebook to sell and raise money to hire a ghostwriter. Cause I was told by my agent at the time, I wasn't good enough. And I, I needed someone else to write the book. Um, a message I'm still getting all these years later from agents, but um, I, I decided that it was way more than 60 pages. I wrote like hundreds and, and it really turned into something really nice. And I just self published it with a little company in Bend, Oregon. And, uh, and the, and, it went on to sell tens of thousands of copies and um, it was amazing. That's awesome. 
It's and a very good book, guys, if you haven't oh, you. bought that. Yeah, I bought it and gave it to my sons. And so that was a few years back. But yeah, I, I love here. Yeah, it came out in 2014 and we yep. toured in Australia like the, literally the next week. It was kind of crazy. Awesome. And, um, had to have a friend at home like ship out self-published books while I was away. <laughs> but, you know, I've done I've done all these different things with publishing. I've done ebook only for um, for two books and one eventually turned into print. That was Plant-Based Muscle. It was ebook mm. only at first. I did another one that's ebook only. And then I just landed a, a major book deal with the world's second largest publisher, HarperCollins. Awesome. And uh, it is a it is a beast, you know, like we started in 2018 and here we are knocking on the door of 2021 and it's not out yet. Uh, it is coming out in a matter of months, but it's it's been a it's been a process. And I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, and we have a great agent, but I had to have a, you know, I, I needed a co-author for this. Um, so I reached out to the best, the best co-author I could think of, um, Matt Fraser from No Meat Athlete. Um, this is way back in 2018. And, and we agreed to collaborate. We'd already endorsed all of each other's books and we'd worked together for 10 years already in some capacity. So we collaborated. We've been working on this for two years and uh, it's, we're, we're going over copy edits right now. Like as we speak, I was up till two in the morning last night, going over copy edits. Oh, and it's a big process, but in this process, what you're going to see with the book is titled The Plant-Based Athlete is that we were able to tell the compelling stories of the world's greatest plant-based athletes mm. um, and, and, in, and in some cases in, in, in depth and detail. And so I interviewed about a hundred elite plant-based athletes, about a dozen Olympic athletes were in that group and maybe wow. 20 world, champ, world champion athletes, um, some Guinness world record holding athletes. Uh, many national champion athletes representing their country as the best in their entire country at, at cycling or running or whatever. Um, and, uh, and we have the stories of about um, 27, I think, 27 of them in, that made it to the book. The rest provided quotes, you know, from mm -hmm. various elite uh, Olympians or former NHL stars or uh, NFL stars or whatever. Um, but we didn't have a full story on them. But, but what you're going to find with the book is that it's really just the accumulation of, of everything that, that Matt and I have worked on for the last X number of decades combined, something like 35 to 40 years experience as plant-based athletes. And so it just takes it a step further from, you know, beyond um, shred it and beyond plant-based muscle and has a, obviously an entire team working behind it at HarperCollins. And we have endorsements from probably 50 plant-based doctors already all the ones wow. you can think of you know Gregor and Esselstyn and Campbell and everybody else uh even so many some are getting removed I saw that in the edits yesterday they were moving a bunch of quotes I'm like oh I really like that doctor but it was it was cut yep um, yep <laughs> so uh, and that's how it goes and, yeah. and and dozens of quotes from these great athletes who cut and all that so it's it's a big it's a big process and big project but what I'm hoping is that this will be kind of like, I don't want to say it, um, you know, with confidence, but kind of like the book equivalent to the game changers, as far as like mm -hmm. impact that we hope to have, because it is with a major publisher. It'll be in every bookstore in America and maybe even big displays in some, in some bookstores. And it'll be something that's on a lot of people's radar. And it features people like James Wilkes from the game changers in the book and Dotsie Bausch from the game changers in the book and Rip mm -hmm. Esselstead. And then a whole bunch of others who are not in the game changers that people get to learn about including some Olympic Olympic medalists, including Olympic gold medalists that 99% that of people have never heard of, didn't even know wow. they were plant-based athletes. Wow. Um, like David Verberg. Any idea who he is? No, he's one of the fastest people on the entire planet. He's an Olympic gold medalist um, in the four by 100 um, oh, meter wow. relay. So he's one of the fastest sprinters on the entire planet. I met him in person, signed books for him and all that. And, and he's been plant-based for years. Most people don't know that, that wow. he's an Olympic gold medalist and one of the best in the entire world. And uh, so we have many stories of, of, of uh, those such athletes that we get to share, as well as all the, the plant-based nutrition stuff um, reviewed by people like Dr. Michael Greger and all that to make sure it's, mm. it's uh, the highest level of quality. Mm. And uh, so you get all the plant-based nutrition, um, uh, meal plans, recipes, all that kind of stuff, including recipes contributed by these elite athletes. Um. And, and some great, uh, absolutely great interviews. You wanna talk about a great interview another Colorado guy, uh, Robbie Ballinger, who ran across America in 75 days. Yes, uh, I've Denver. been following him on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, his story of running from California uh, to New York in 75 days, uh, 
just just incredible and so much fun to write. Like that was just a, such a fun story to write. Um, and yeah, and Megan Duhamel, who almost gave up on her Olympic dreams and then went on to become, you know, Canada's one of most decorated uh, uh, figure skaters and won an Olympic gold medal. And now she's on TV doing some other, you know, Olympic or some sort of figure skating thing on television right now and just had a baby, just retired. And um, and just some, just so many great, we have, we have some people who've been vegan since birth, like who went on to become professional athletes and set world records and uh, really neat stuff that a lot of people don't know about. And that's the exciting thing is that we're not just talking about the famous NFL and NBA stars. Of course, we mentioned them, you know, Chris Paul and JaVale McGee and Cam Newton and all that. But Lori, one thing you'll, you probably recognize as well, and it's challenging with the book is that the more famous the person for whatever reason, the more their diet changes frequently. Mm. You know, like, like I talked to Mike Tyson in person about his plant-based diet or vegan diet, actually vegan. He said he'd been vegan for years at the time I talked to him and yeah. you know, he's not anymore. And so, and same with a few other athletes that we had, we had written about even just casually in the book. And now we've got to kind of question whether we keep that in there or not. I mean, obviously some things like change the course of those athletes' careers, help them lose 100 pounds or reclaim their health or increase their speed, which then changed their whole trajectory in their career. And a plant-based diet was the catalyst for that. So it's still worth telling, even if they're not 100% plant-based you know, today. Mm -hmm. But we certainly tried to focus on those who are um, totally plant-based, like Laura Klein, who's the one, I think, the duathlon world championship, uh, world champion plant-based athlete, and who's been vegan for 15 years. And those stories are fun to tell, where it's not like, Oh yeah, this person was already the best in the world, adopted a plant-based diet and sustained it mm. or, or even like dropped their performance. Like, no, these are people who've been doing this in some cases for decades, mm. like the Rip Esselstyn, who, by the way, you know, you, you may have learned, he just set a world record um, recently in the backstroke. Yep. I did read about that because he's yeah. 50s, mid fifties, right? Or uh, maybe actually late upper, like is he? 57, 58. Wow. And John Joseph, who's, who's in the book, yeah. just did an Ironman triathlon last week. It didn't go as well as he had hoped, but he's 58 years old. He's knocking on the door to age 60. Yeah. And he's, and he's, for those who don't listening, who don't know, that's <laughs> swimming, swimming 2.4 miles, immediately jumping out on a bike and riding for 112 miles and then running a 26.2 mile marathon all in the same day. Mm -hmm. And by the yeah. way, we have a woman in the book who's been vegan since birth, who does, um, <laughs> I don't even know what the sport is. But she does something like 40 or 50 consecutive Ironman triathlons. <laughs> and so her, her races, like the finish line, it says it took her like 45 days, 17 hours and whatever minutes. So she races for months on end. Oh, my like she'll, goodness. Like, like, like she'll run, like she'll, I don't know what this, I don't know what, I had to look at the book, the numbers, like she'll swim some crazy amount. She'll bike like 5,000 miles and run, you know, in the hundreds oh. of miles, all as, all as part of a race. And she's been... A vegan since birth and her brother is actually olympic medalist and x games world champion also vegan since birth um wow. uh shonda and kevin hill they're in uh, british columbia uh, wow that, oh. that's the kind of stuff we, like uh, women i don't want to give them all away but like you know <laughs> darcy who the first woman ever to kayak the entire length of the amazon river four thousand miles took her five oh. months she encountered all kinds of crazy things even had to cut her hair um to disguise her um, you know, her identity, gender, yeah. yeah, her gender identity, because there's like, there's all kinds of pirates and stuff out there and crazy. That sounds like a movie. <laughs> yeah. Illegal logging going on along the Amazon that if, and if they think she's a reporter, they'll just, you know, she could be killed. Um, oh. and, and she did it as, you know, and she's been plant-based for, uh, 20 years now, vegan for 20 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah, like, that, this, this, like these fun stories that, because, you know, you can, you can get bored just reading about the benefits of broccoli <laughs> and, and, and foods that don't cause inflammation, like that can be boring at times. And so right. I wanted to tell the stories, the compelling stories of, of the world's greatest and most interesting yes. <laughs> athletes. There's some really interesting athletes in there too, who have great, great stories to tell of crazy feats they've accomplished and they credit a plant-based diet for doing so. And so Again, there's 20 something other stories I didn't just share in the book, plus another 50 or 60 athletes who provided quotes about how plant-based diet has uh, impacted their lives in their, wow. in their athletic career. So it's wow. 434 pages in my file right now, so <laughs> 100,000 words. It's a big project. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, no, I, there's so much I could ask. I'm trying to decide which way to go here. Um, no, that's phenomenal. I mean, I, I just, it gets me excited. Just the idea of speaking to people with those type of stories, vegan or not, it's in compelling, but you know, these are the stories that, that will move people. It's not the facts that might be like 5% of the population. Yeah. I'm like, this is the facts of a plant-based diet. And they're like, okay, you know, like for me, I was very factual. Like this makes sense. But then there's this compelling emotional lever that they connect with. And that is what inspires someone to even consider the diet change. So I think this is going to be great. Well, oh. consider on that, on that note, I mean, consider um, Josh Lajani, you know, Josh. Yes, yes I know. How, Josh do you, well. how do you go, how do you go from being 420 pounds, you know, morbidly obese to not only running uh, ultra marathons, but winning, winning an ultra marathon. He, he's, he's finished first. He's finished second. I think he's finished third. Another story that was just one of my favorites to write because what you're, what you're seeing people do or hearing about their experiences are things that are almost so unrelatable, but are inspirational at the same time. Mm -hmm. We have people who, who, you know, attempted suicide, um, and went on to become Olympic medalists later on and, mm -hmm. and advocates for a plant-based diet and health. Um, eating disorders, uh, debilitating that, that, injuries, yeah. like setbacks of, of, of one type or another, um, a, a, abuse, uh, all kinds of things, and, and went on to become, you know, uh, oftentimes some of the best in the world at what they do. Mm. And that's like, you know, because we all have issues, right? We all have we all, what do you want to call them? Demons or setbacks or problems or addictions or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, me whining about my back problems are nothing compared to what a lot of these other people have gone through, right? Mm -hmm. Like it gives some perspective of, you know, here's someone who has no business doing this. You don't go from 400 pounds being an ultra run. You don't even go from 400 pounds running a 5K, you know, <laughs> let alone a marathon or <laughs> ultra marathon. Like what? So there's something in here it's not their physical, it's not just the, what you learn about their physical body changing because of the, the, uh, you know, um, app, you know, uh, the, the removal of, of animal products and the inclusion of plant-based products, but there's something going on up here and, and oftentimes in here too. And that's what you, you, you take away from, because like you said, Lori, you and I have both been giving presentations for years it's not the facts and numbers people remember. It's the stories connected to them. Mm -hmm. Like that's like, that's how you give a great talk. That's why politicians talk about, you know, that my, I met this woman in Flint, Michigan. And she told me like that, that sticks with you. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to connect with a story that, that, mm -hmm. that brings about emotion and, and something that, that brings you into it. And so that's what I particularly tried to do mm -hmm. as the primary narrator was to, bring these stories out uh, mm -hmm. uh, of these people. And they're, some of them are unbelievable. I mean, don't even get me started on like John Joseph's story and, you know, people oh, like that. I'm, his story is incredible. And then Josh was one of my very first podcast interviews. And yeah. that's why, I, honestly, because as a physician, so I'm a family practice. So I see, I've delivered babies. My oldest patient's probably been 104. I've had the the breadth for 20 years and was in the military, done all these things. But the one thing that I couldn't figure out was like why one person could change their life overnight to this and have these amazing successes. So like Josh, you know, he's one of the, when he got the, on the cover of Runner's World, I made him, I said, I was like, I'm saying, would you please sign it and send it back to me? Cause it's just so inspirational. And that's the cool thing was I'm trying to dig into like their brain, right? He's like, what is going on in your three pound organ between your ears? It's not working in my other patients because I need to understand so I can help. And um, you're exactly right. Like Dotsie Bosch, she was a cocaine addict and an eating disorder. Yeah. And she's like, it goes on to win, you know, a silver in the cycling. And I was like, I think that's fabulous. But what was it that flipped for you? <laughs> that yeah. for me is the gold medal right there. And it's, a, uh, am excited to read. I can't wait to read this. This is, it's, yeah. this is well, right in my to, alley. <laughs> I have to say, Dotsie was the very first person I interviewed for the whole book. Oh, wow. And, she's amazing. and I mean, I interviewed her, you know, in person in California and, I was like, you know, nervous and everything. I had already met her, but I was still nervous. I'm, you know, I'm trying to uh, like recording on my iPad for an hour and a half, like recording as I'm interviewing her and asking questions. <laughs> and 
trying to manage my own anxiety issues and all this. And, um, and, and it was, you know, it, it was great. And then, and then she was the, one of the most helpful people mm. period in this book process, as far as connecting me with other plant-based athletes. So she gets a special place in the acknowledgements, um, especially she works in that Olympic athlete community. Mm -hmm. And so essentially if there's an Olympic athlete, we interviewed for the book, it's because of Dotsie, uh, awesome. like David Verberg, who I mentioned and uh, Megan Duhamel, who I mentioned and, and a bunch of others, you know, Heather Mitz and Rebecca Sony and, and, uh, and others. So uh, Dotsie is, uh, deserves a lot of credit for I mean, even the role that she played in this book. And Rip Esselstyn was the second most like involved as far as introducing me to other people like Sonia Looney, world champion mountain biker. Wow. Um, again, you talk about up here, uh, she has an entire section in the book about, about mental toughness and mental strength. Wow. Because I mean, she set like the, she won the world record for uh, most miles biked in 24 hours. And uh, much like Scott Jurek did, who's also in the book, who ran 165 miles in 24 hours. I mean, how do you do this? <laughs> and so we do have we do have sections on that. That's why the, the book, I think, is going to be so good. It's not just saying here, um, you know, have a salad with every meal, eat primarily fruits and vegetables and, and you know, limit grains a little bit. Have, make sure you get legumes in there for added protein and, and go go for a walk every day and, and lift a little bit of weight and you're good. Like that, you could be one pager, right? Be right, one pager. right, exactly. But some of it is like, we have 1,440 minutes in a day. How do we determine how we use those? Mm. What kind of patterns do we get in? What kind of use of time? What kind of addictions and habits do we have? What kind of habits are impossible for us to break until we like fight with ourselves in ourselves, like to, mm -hmm. to change those habits? Um, how do we find meaning and purpose in what we do? Does, does life really matter? Do, like, do I make a difference in the world? Like all these things go through our minds um, do I give myself a re reward for this? Do I, do I create these systems where there's like, the, you know, the pleasure trap, um, where, the, where there's uh, some sort of reward mechanism? Um, am I doing this for myself? Am I doing this for a bigger purpose or larger cause? Is that, am I being too altruistic? Is that even too cliche or cheesy that I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do this for the animals or I'm trying to do this for future generations? Like what is the iron will inside us that makes us remarkable and that's the that's the word is remarkable worth yeah. remarking about that's why these people are in the book i interviewed a hundred of them why did only 27 make it yeah. um because they're remarkable you know like mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they're the greatest athlete it doesn't mean that john joseph is a better athlete than somebody else it means his story was more compelling oh my goodness his stories yeah so a friend of mine <laughs> a friend of mine sent me his book meat is for pussies to get to my husband he's already plant based, but it was just <laughs> I mean, so, but that, I mean, if you're going to be like a heavy rocker, I mean, this, this, this guy is hilarious. You just got to tune out some of the language if that bothers you, but it's really, he's incredible. I love his Instagram. He just pulls no punches. He's like, this is the way it is. <laughs> you know what's funny? I met him in person. I was featured in his first book, his very first um, version of that book. That was the self-published version. Um, I had a photo in there and we met in Portland, Oregon about 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I went to one of his shows and he said, you know, make sure you stay in the back, you know, don't get knocked out in the mosh pit. And, and so, and so I did, I like stayed safe. You know, we went out, I think probably had dinner afterwards or something. And I, 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 uh, randomly was walking down the streets of New York city one time, just totally randomly. And he's like, Hey, Robert Cheek, what, what are you doing here? Like, was he giving a tour or something? He was just walking down the street and we just crossed paths and, <laughs> and um, and that was totally random. But what I was going to say, the funny thing is that we were in. Los Angeles. And I was with like that vegan crew of like Mac Danzig, this is back in the day, Brendan Brazier. And we just finished working at Expo West, right? So like kind of dressed a little bit nicely and, uh -huh. and, and John is doing a show that night. So I show up with a sweater and a collar, right? And everybody else is wearing all black and tattooed and, and hair, you know, punk hair. I'm wearing this green sweater with a collar coming out of it, like a white collar. And we have photos backstage with like John and Mac Danzig and all these people. Oh and I, I just I, I just look like I'm completely out of place. <laughs> Show up at a punk concert looking like some preppy, you know, like Stanford kid or something. Uh, oh, or FBI or something. Then you start thinking about those movies where you see like the FBI walking in on the... <laughs> A rocker show or something. <laughs> I could just see that. Oh my goodness, that would be funny. Oh my goodness. Yeah, good, good, good times. Um, good times with that crew, and 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 again, so many other stories in the book, and oh wow, and some really interesting people. Um, oh. 
and not just the usual suspects, like I said, there's only about three or four who are in the game changers. All mm-hmm. the other dozens are, are people that you may not even know. They're, they're national champion cyclists um, in Estonia, for example. Um, oh, wow. Caitlin, um, or, you know, or, uh, or Ireland's national uh, champion uh, uh, track racer um, or uh, Austria's uh, Olympic 1500 meter runner, Andres mm-hmm. Voita. Like there's, I mean, I don't know these people, but their stories are really interesting. So that's, that's the, that's the fun part is introducing these people to the audience. Uh, And that is fun too, because my husband sent me a um, article about a Scottish uh, ultra distance runner who happened to mention in this non-vegan, you know, publication that he was plant-based he goes yeah you should try to interview him I was like this is awesome so he he lives in Scotland and he ran all the Scottish you know mountains which are like 3,000 above 3,000 feet you know we live in Colorado it's a little different but still he ran 289 of those in 31 days so it was like almost 800 miles of running he did kayaking he self-propelled between them it was like climbing Mount Everest 14 times and so I got I interviewed him it was so fun to talk to him so now he's my coach for the distance running. So I talk to him every week and he's helping me get going. And so, I mean, this is incredible. Like these people, are, there's so many more of them, right? So like my my youngest just did his first half Ironman in September. And I'm just, wow. you know, it's, it's just really fun to see. He ran all the way through high school, cross country, he's plant-based and kind of like you did the, the vegan thing. But um, it is just really fun to see these amazing people that, you're like, whoa, I haven't heard about you. And you did some cool stuff. It's just, they're so inspiring. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's, and that's what we hope. That's what we hope to accomplish with the plant-based athlete is to share these stories. And, and of course, you know, the moment the book comes out, then there's a million other ones. Just like, I'm sure yeah. the game changers felt that as soon as they're fucking <laughs> out, now there's, now there's all these NFL players and all these other, like, oh, oh. <laughs> film. same thing with the book. You have to like, you know, you're going to miss out on a bunch of stories, including right. this guy I just told you about, this famous pro wrestler who's working on making a comeback to WWE right now. He just became vegan like weeks ago. Wow. He might be interesting to feature in the book, but again, you don't know how long he's going to stick with it and, and you got to be careful and, and all right. that. Right. So, no, yeah. So you got to stick to the hard and true in and out regardless. Yeah, yeah. And we've got a lot of them in the book. So, uh, so very, very proud I, of it. I'm totally stoked about this. So you'll see, it'll be, I'm assuming it'll be also links on your website at the time when it's available and in all the yeah. books, like you said, Amazon and yeah, all that. You, won't, you won't be able to miss it. They're giving us like a four month period uh, to hype it up and promote it for pre-sales and everything. So awesome. like, I mean, you'll hear about it very soon in the new year. Like, I mean, you know, all over the place. We have cool. publicity team and all this. It's all new for me. I don't, I used to do everything myself with my wife's help uh, with <laughs> self-publishing. I don't know now I have like agent, publicist, all this stuff. Like it's pretty, it's just, it's kind of weird. Well, I, that's cool because I started this podcast by myself and now the boys. So my, my middle one graduated in marketing. My daughter's actually about to graduate medical school in May. And oh. then my, my, so I'm like, Hey, I birthed a plant-based doctor. I did my part now. So, and then the, my son, my youngest is a film. He's a film major at CU graduating in May too. So I'm like, I got the crew, man. They're editing for me now. I'm like, I've done my, I've done my share. <laughs> cool. Uh, make sure they make me look good with the big <laughs> beard here and the, sh- and the, and the uh, quarantine hair. And oh, the well, they're, my, my husband is Filipino, so they can't grow facial hair. They're going to have some hair jealousy going. They're like, did you see that hair on Robert? <laughs> yeah, except, except I just turned 40 and it's like already white. Oh. And, like I was always clean shaven until like a year and a half ago, but I go for like, you know, I get lazy. I go for like five or six days, and I would say to my wife, "Like, you see this blonde spot?" <laughs> and you know, it's my thirties. You know, and I'm and I feel like you. Like you said, you're you're almost fifty, and happy early birthday. By I the am way. fifty. Oh, I turned fifty already. I'm already oh, well, there. Okay, well, happy, but, but you don't know, you <laughs> feel that, and I often still yeah. feel like I'm that twenty-five year old new vegan kid. Like I, I forget. Yeah. That. Like if you know, I don't have kids or anything. I feel like how am I this forty-year-old adult now? But so I was like. Yeah, I see this blonde spot. It's kind of weird. And finally, after a few weeks, finally after a few weeks, she's like, "You know, I don't think it's blonde because I mean, my hair's short now. But if it's right. when it's longer, it's like bright blonde. Like yeah. even just a couple weeks ago, before I cut it, so I have bright <laughs> blonde hair, um, which is kind of unique. But I have this blonde hair, and so she's like, "Yeah, I don't think that's uh, that's blonde." And then sure enough, I have this like I'm like Santa Claus here. Oh like, no, I age, see. At age forty, I'm Santa. Oh, let me tell you, my friend. So, you know, with age of COVID, there's no going to see the hairstylist and getting things colored. I didn't color until early 40s. 
and now I'm growing it as like, whoa, there is a lot of silver going on in here. So, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we're, I'm just not quite ready to embrace it. We'll see. We'll you know, see. a lot of people made it cool, you know, for, for at least for men, it was like George Clooney and a few others. I'm, made it I'm cool. not a man though. Girls are a little different. They, I, I get, it, it, it is, but I, but I've, I've seen other people like you know, <laughs> really embrace like, you know, full Brace gray it. or full white or full, like, whatever. <laughs> um, like, it's, 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 it's like, pretty, it's cool. It's, um, it's bordering my grandmother's pure white by 40 and then it's pushing in that element. I'm like, mm, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, um, I'm playing with it. idea. So anyway, <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Well, this is wonderful. And I just, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. I'm so sorry I took you over the hour, but, um, is there anything that you'd like to give? I always ask if there's any last bit of advice, maybe there's someone, you know, maybe there is that young, person in high school or college and they're wanting to do the kind of bodybuilding or you know doing a plant-based athlete type of thing yeah just the beginning where should they start like what type of advice would you give someone like that yeah or a parent of someone like that that's that's important too yeah i think that the most important thing to start with is to just just start adding in your favorite plant-based foods like in just so they just take over the diet. You know, if you love potatoes, if you love yams or lentils or beans or oats or rice or specific vegetables or fruits and, and the, the more the fruits and vegetables, the better or your favorite nuts and nut butters, just incorporate as many of those as possible. And, and hopefully, you know, animal foods and animal byproducts will naturally fall by the wayside because you'll get, you'll get the nourishment, the the uh, satiation, the, the fuel, the fiber, and all these things that your body needs. But I would also say, this is the number one thing you've seen me write about in my books. The number one thing I talk about, especially for athletes, those transitioning from an omnivore diet to a fully plant-based diet is you need to be aware of your total calorie consumption. All of us have certain calorie needs. It depends on our gender, age, height, weight, activity level, what our calorie needs are. And because plant-based foods are not very calorie dense. They're very nutrient dense, but calorie poor. And animal-based foods are very calorie dense and oftentimes nutrient poor. But in order to maintain the same muscle mass or the same size and weight, uh, especially for men who are into you know, sports and, and, and working out, you need to consume comparable caloric intake. Mm -hmm. So what I see all the time, I've seen this for 25 years, you'll see these football players, basketball players, whatever. I'm, I'm mostly referring to men here because it, it's men that, that have this problem. They come to me all the time because it's, and again, it happens to be mostly men that don't often want the weight, weight loss in, especially mm -hmm. as athletes, and they don't want to lose strength, is that they're consuming maybe 3,500 calories a day and then adopt a fully plant-based diet. They cut out all meat, all dairy, all eggs, all you know processed foods that have meat ingredients, which oftentimes means fewer oils, you know, and so they lose a ton of calories and they replace it with potatoes and kale and broccoli and oats and spinach and, and uh, rice and whatever. And now all of a sudden, maybe their total calorie intake is 2,500 instead of 3,500. Mm. And they say, why did I lose strength? Why, or why do I lose energy? Why did I do this? When you just cut out 30% of your cal total calorie intake, what do you expect? And so that's what I say is that you've got, you've got to be aware of that. I mean, I, as a bodybuilder, throughout a lot of my adult life, I had complete control over my, my body weight, whether I was gonna gain or lose weight. Cause I, I understood the science of it. I understood the mathematics mm. of it. I understood the biology of it. I understood that if I, if I wanna gain mass and build mass, I need to eat in a cal caloric surplus and combine that with resistance weight training and adequate rest and hydration and all that to achieve the specific result. And you could even break it down into the numbers, like how many extra calories you need to consume per, per day in order to elicit this certain response on a weekly basis, as far as weight gain over the course of a period of time, you can, you can do that. You can break that down. In fact, I did in my book shredded, I believe. And then same with weight loss. Um, it, you know, um, other factors, you know, thyroid function and all that permitting you can again, adjust a calorie intake based on your true calorie needs and your expenditure to create a, a weight loss or fat loss process that's going to yield results based mm. on understanding the numbers and avoiding certain foods, like avoiding um, processed foods, avoiding oils, avoiding um, refined sugars, uh, maybe maybe avoiding um, you know eating certain types of foods very late at night where you're not going to burn calories off or, or doing specific fat burning exercise in a fasted state um, to have more efficient fat burning processes. 
there's things of that nature. So in a nutshell, I would say you've, you've got to find the foods that you love. You've got to incorporate, because if it's not fun, and you just stuck just eating, you know, tofu and lettuce, you're not going to love it. And so you've got to find the plant-based foods you love and uh, include them in copious amounts to reach your, your, your calorie needs. And then what I would also ask people, and I say this in almost every, uh, in almost every interview and every conversation, um, a quote from H. Jackson Brown Jr. who said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things that you did do. Mm. And he goes on to add a bunch of poetic stuff, you know, like, you know, um, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. I don't care about the poetic stuff. I care about whether it's 20 years from now or two years from now, we don't want to be asking what might have been. Mm. What if I would have chased that dream of, uh, of, of reclaiming my health or pursuing a sport or pursuing an academic pursuit or something like that? Uh, but I, ne- I didn't have the courage to do it or I didn't believe in myself enough. Mm. And that's what I think is, is something that we need to think about, you know, a lot. Like, what do we do with the 1,440 minutes we have each day? And what do we want to do with our time that we have here? And that we don't want to be asking what might have been because we didn't have the courage to do it. And so I sit here, you know, a quarter century into this vegan lifestyle just feeling grateful and appreciative for a decision that my my 15 year old self made mm-hmm. that shaped the course of my entire life that enabled me to even be in a position to chase a childhood dream of being an author mm-hmm. uh, and achieve it and to be a champion athlete and to achieve it and to write books and travel the world. These are all things that these are legitimate things that I wanted to do. I wanted to travel the world because my dad did. Right. I wanted to write books because my dad did. Um, you know, I wanted to be a, 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 a athlete because that's what I grew up watching on TV and playing sports. And, mm. and, and a plant-based diet not only helped with those things, but an approach right here that said, I want to make the most of each day is what really enabled me to do it. I, I just, I created consistent patterns. I wrote goals. I remind myself of goals. Some goals took 30 years to achieve, like landing a major book deal, um, it took years before I ever became a champion bodybuilder, but I, I did those things because of what I do today makes a difference a week from now. And what I do a week from now makes a difference a month from now. What I do a month from now makes a difference a year from now. Mm-hmm. And what I, and what I do, you know, now may make a difference five or 10 years from now. And I'm aware of those things. I basically, for whatever reason, I was lucky to be able to understand how to connect the dots from when I was a kid. I, I, just, I just knew that I knew someday I would be a writer. I knew someday I would, mm-hmm published books. I knew someday I would visit places like Australia and Asia and Europe. I, I knew someday I would be in magazines and on magazine covers and that I would maybe produce my own movie, which I did. And I, I just, because I, not that I just manifested it and, and all that, but I worked at it. I created a vision and I worked every day at it. And, and one example, I guess to end with, because I say this in a lot of my talks, is that there've been multiple periods in my life, but one specific one where I did over a hundred pushups and crunches for 839 consecutive days. And it had nothing to do with building my chest or ab muscles, absolutely nothing. It had everything to do with building patterns that I could like, I, I could realize that, man, if I did this for two and a half years and never missed a day, then I can write two pages every day and write a book, you know, mm, that, that kind of so, true. That kind of self-awareness, like I wouldn't be writing books today if I didn't do push-ups and crunches every day um, for, I did it over 800 consecutive days one, one time, I did over, over 700 consecutive days another time, and I either just either forgot or got sick or something ended those streaks. Um, but that's why I did it, so that I could give myself the confidence that I could write every day, mm-hmm. or that I could do things when, you know, when they're challenging, and, mm-hmm. you know, and it wouldn't just like shut me down. It wouldn't just like stop me. So that's what I would say. And, and in a nutshell, that's follow your passion and make it happen. <laughs> I, I, that was beautiful. I think this is literally, it's a philosophy of life, which is so very important that we should be teaching our children and our young ones, but the, that caloric intake, I learned very early on. So when I started doing this in practice in 2012 in Western Colorado, in a town called Rifle, it literally, think about it. It's like, right. That's what you're, there's steakhouses and that's about it. There's a Walmart. <laughs> you're like, 
but I had patients and I was trying to learn how to do this. Thank God for Dr. McDougall. And he had a few articles for physicians on how to transition patients to this as I was doing it myself with my family. But I had patients come back. I would just say, eat plants. And they'd come back just eating fruits and vegetables and be exhausted and not eating enough calories. And then it, that, that message was the very first lesson I remember specifically about, I have to make sure that I so emphasize they have to eat enough food because I just didn't appreciate the caloric difference. So absolutely 100%. And we were on that vegan cruise. I went to your workshop and a lady asked, um, so most of my people that contact me, or you can imagine are middle-aged women. The So she asked, she goes, I'm doing everything plant-based and I just can't lose weight. And your simple was like, you have to eat less. That, I mean, it really was your answer. And it was like, yes, that is true. <laughs> eat less or, or, or expend more. Or expend like, more or go, both. Go for two walks a day, go for yeah. hiking, uh, go for a hike. Um, use this, the greatest tool in the world for me, it seems to be the Stairmaster or actually mm -hmm. climbing real stairs. Like that's just the best thing to burn calories mm -hmm. and, and, and get your heart rate going and, and tone your muscles like, at the same time. Like that's what I use to get my best shape ever is the Stairmaster. And if people don't have access to that, go, go climb stairs somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, or go, go hiking. I mean, there's just the hiking for me and then the outdoor, you'd be outside with nature and absolutely perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing. The answer is there. And as our, as our dear friend, one of my absolute favorites in the entire world, uh, Dr. Clapper says, it's the food, it's the food, it's the food. So we just have to be aware of that. So if you want, yes. if you, if you yes. like things like chocolates and you like more calorie dense stuff, okay, then be more active. Don't sit at a computer for 14 hours a day like I do. Um, <laughs> go do something, you know, go do dog walks every day, go out in nature. And, and when you do that, you start to you, know, you think a little bit more clearer and you, you get more, more creative and you get ideas because you're mm -hmm. out of your box here. Like here I am sitting in the basement. Um, I got to get out. I, I, I'm getting out after this. I, and I do yeah. dog walks every day and I, you know, I find exercise. So, um, yep. so yeah, it's the food, it's the food, it's the food, but it's also, it's what you do, what you do, what you do. <laughs> I, that is a perfect way to, but literally I'm sitting on my, uh, because of JP, imagine that I bought a rebel desk. It's a, it's a walking treadmill to be underneath your desk. So I have my wife has one. It, exactly. And the only reason I bought it is because of JP back to JP. It all goes back to JP. <laughs> yeah. And, and Gregor's got one too. Dr. Gregor's yeah, yes, got one yes, too. Which JP told him about as well. I did find that out. So oh, <laughs> it that, goes that, back to that. JP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Robert, so much for spending some time with us. And this is going to be phenomenal. I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy all the wisdom that you have shared with us today. Well, thank you, Lori. This is a lot of fun. I really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity and, um, I'm looking forward to turn the heat back on here in the basement. So I didn't have it running. So it wasn't, uh, cold, it wasn't, it wasn't noisy down here, but I feel like I might be getting some sniffles. Um, oh, okay. you no, know, but I, I look forward to turn the heat back on. I hope you have a, uh, a wonderful rest of 2020 and a great new year. And I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to uh, spend with me today and ask some questions and allow me uh, to ramble probably more than I needed to, but to share some interesting stories and maybe it gave some people some perspective and a few things to think about. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe button and the alert button so you will be notified whenever we upload any new videos. On Monday, we upload the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find it on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. On Tuesdays, we upload The Doctors In. This is where I answer your questions. Thinking of that, could you please comment below any questions you might have about health or wellness or any topics that you would like me to cover? Now, if you're looking for more resources on how to start a plant-based diet, sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, anything regarding wellness, we've got you covered. Check out HealthyHumanRevolution.com. And again, thanks for watching.